expect to find on the basis of spontaneous mutation. Now, so the next step in the process of trying to identify what was the material that was present in the cell-free extracts that could endow rough bacteria with smooth, the properties of smooth. A group at Rockefeller, at that time Institute, now University, uh, Abe, Oswald Avery, McLeod, and McCarty went through the ritual of fractionating that complex extract and found that the activity did not depend on the presence of protein, did not depend on the presence of polysaccharide, did not depend on the presence of lipid or RNA from the smooth bacteria, but depended on a material that was, at, until that time, thought to be uh, relatively unimportant, something called DNA. Uh, it was a polymer. When extracted from bacteria, it formed viscous solutions. If you precipitated it with alcohol, insoluble in an alcohol water mixture, it precipitates as fibers they were able to demonstrate that this material appeared to be responsible for what they called, appeared to be the transforming principle, the material basis for converting bacteria that started out rough plus some extract from smooth gave rise to smooth bacteria. Now, you could say, well, this uh, fibrous material, the stuff that causes all the viscosity in solution, is very high molecular weight. And even a little bit of protein, which has a much lower molecular weight, could be devastating. And in fact, there were strong advocates of that point of view. For example, suppose that the protein contamination was present at a level of one-tenth of one percent, one part per thousand. If the DNA were, had a molecular weight, say, of a million, or 10 million, for example, and the protein had a molecular weight of 10,000, then there would be as many molecules in that solution of DNA as there were of protein, even though in weight the protein only made up 0.1% of the solution. Nevertheless, it was this was probably the first time that people used enzymological criteria for characterization of a material. The investigator showed that the activity in this purified DNA preparation was not compromised by the presence or the treatment with proteolytic enzymes like trypsin and pepsin and chymotrypsin they had no effect on the activity. And they argued on that basis that it's not likely that protein was involved. They further showed that the activity was not sensitive to what was then new on the scene, crystalline ribonuclease. They could treat the preparations with crystalline ribonuclease under conditions where RNA was degraded and no loss of activity was ever evident. And they further showed, perhaps most importantly, that when they treated this material with deoxyribonuclease, an enzyme that destroyed the viscosity, eliminated the viscosity of these DNA preparations, when they treated with that enzyme, an enzyme which presumably degrades DNA, the activity disappeared. On that basis, they argued that the DNA itself was in fact responsible for transmitting 
this genetic property from parent to progeny. Notice that this will now replace by DNA from smooth bacteria. Here we take viable bacteria, we treat them with DNA, we isolate clones of smooth bacteria from which DNA can be isolated and used again to transform rough bacteria. That's in fact one of the criteria we want to maintain as a feature of genetic material. Now perhaps more importantly, over the next several years, beginning in about the mid-40s, it became apparent that one didn't have to restrict oneself to this kind of phenotype, the smooth versus rough, that one could isolate bacteria from the newly emerging, that were resistant to the newly emerging antibiotics. One could isolate bacteria that had, were streptomycin sensitive, isolate streptomycin resistant bacteria or penicillin resistant bacteria and so on. One could isolate DNA from these resistant bacteria treat the sensitive bacteria with that DNA and get transformation. So many properties, many genetic properties, heritable properties of these cells could be introduced as a result of treating the bacteria with the appropriate DNA. Now, That was, this identification was first reported in 1944-1945. It's interesting that it was an experiment that was found acceptable to many physicists and largely ignored by many biologists. It wasn't until in the early 50s, another experiment was done that is in fact, in its total, less compelling. But that experiment resulted in a wildfire enlightenment of the community. And that experiment was carried out by Hershey and Chase and made use of bacteriophage as a biological entity. We've mentioned bacterial viruses earlier. We'll talk a little bit more about them today and more in the next several lectures. Now, let's, what they in fact demonstrated or their experiments were consistent with the notion that the DNA of the bacterial virus was the germinal material. Proof? Perhaps. The experiment was the following sort. Let's ask the question, what a phage? We'll talk about a bacteriophage. In this case, it was a phage that was called T2. The phage particle, by microscopy, is a structure that has a tail. It's more complex than that, but for the moment, that's sufficient. Its dimension is of the order of about 0 0.1 microns. A micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay. If you want it in angstroms, it's about 10 to the third angstroms. It's smaller than the wavelength of visible light. You can't see them by visible light. Now, the bacterium has a dimension of about one micron, 10 times bigger. The volume is about 1,000 times larger. And in fact, if you weigh these particles, if you assess their mass, they're of the order of 3 times 10 to the minus 16th grams. And a bacterium, E. coli, has a weight, a mass of about 2 times 10 to the minus 13th grams. 
just to give you a notion of what ballpark we're talking about. Now, this virus has two major components, perhaps only two components, protein and DNA. About half and half in terms of mass. Now, the only phosphorus containing component of the phage is the DNA. The only sulfur containing component of the virus is the protein and only those proteins that contain cysteine and methionine. That makes it possible for us to put a tracer on either the DNA or on the protein. The bacteria in which this virus is grown could be growing in a minimal medium containing phosphate as we described earlier and that phosphate could be spiked with a little bit of P32 containing phosphate. If we grow the phage, then we have DNA labeled with P32. If we grow the phage in such bacteria. Furthermore, we could also grow another population of phage in a medium in which the sulfate is spiked with a little bit of sulfur 35, which is radioactive. And in that case, we have protein, which is 35S labeled, is radioactive, and we can follow it. And in fact, Hershey and Chase carried out an experiment in which they labeled phage either with P32 or with sulfur 35 and asked what happens when these labeled phages infect bacteria if we could follow the various components the protein versus the DNA maybe we can learn something about what's happening now they took advantage of the notion that this phage attaches to the bacterium via the tail and you could tell that by electron microscopy they inferred and it turned out to be correct that if you took infected bacteria and exposed them to high shearing forces in fact they used a piece of kitchen apparatus at the time called a wearing blender you probably all know about blenders the first blender that was on the market was called a wearing blender if you take infected bacteria and agitate them vigorously in a blender, exposing them to very high shear forces, what in fact happens is that this gets knocked off. What they in fact did was infect bacteria with the labeled phage, allowed a small exposure for absorption, then they centrifuged the bacteria down to get rid of anything that was garbage in the phage preparation so that you only had infected bacteria. So now you have resuspended in your culture bacteria that are infected with either phage that were labeled with P32 or phage that were labeled with sulfur 35. At various times after that resuspension from zero to some time T, a sample of that suspension is exposed to high shear forces and the question is asked, exposed, put into the wearing blender, then centrifuge the bacteria after the shearing and look at what fraction of the label is connected with the bacteria that remain and what fraction is released into the medium.
Now the first thing you want to know is, does the shearing kill bacteria or remove infective centers? And in fact, if you say, if you look at infective centers, they drop a little bit, but less than 10%. So no matter when you shear over this period of time, which is probably about five minutes, infective centers are not compromised. In other words, the infection still worked. If you ask the question, how much sulfur, how much radioactive sulfur is in the supernate? What you find is the amount of radioactive sulfur goes up and saturates at about 75%. This is sulfur in the supernate. In other words, much, most, whatever ver word you want to use, most of the sulfur appears to be removable, dispensable after the infection. In other words, you can take this off and it no longer compromises the infection. If you ask the question, how much of the DNA is present in the supernate, what happens is you see about 30% of the DNA turns up in the supernate. The remainder remains associated with the bacteria. Now, about half of this 30% is present unconnected with the bacteria even before blending. So that looks like it's partly garbage in the experiment. But the substance of this experiment is, says that most of the protein is indispensable after absorption and most of the DNA remains associated with the infective center after you've gotten rid of the head. In fact, it's possible to do the experiment of taking using enzymes again. You can use deoxyribonuclease. Phage particles, half of whose material is DNA, the DNA in phage particles is insensitive to deoxyribonuclease. But if you infect bacterial cell membranes, if you ex expose the phage to bacterial cell membranes, or to heat kill bacteria that become permeable to proteins, then the phage DNA does become sensitive to deoxyribonuclease. So something happens when the phage hits a bacterial cell wall, its tail gets uncorked and the DNA comes out. So the notion is that infection involves injecting the DNA into the bacterium and the DNA has to remain with the bacterium in order to produce a successful infective center. Now, of the phage protein no longer has a function after infection. And the protein is required for anchoring the phage to the bacteria and once and allowing the DNA to move across the barrier. Once the DNA has crossed, then the infective center is home free with regard to producing more phage. Now, one important feature of this experiment that was carried out was to show that if you looked at the phage that came out of these bacteria, remember these bacteria have still, still have 70% of the DNA, DNA phosphorus associated with them. You can ask the question, when phage come out of these bacteria, do those particles have this phosphorus? 
and about half of that phosphorus is present in the progeny phage. There is transmission from parent to progeny. The efficiency of transmission is not one, but that can be rationalized in a variety of ways. What's important is that if you ask for any sulfur in these phages, it's virtually undetectable. Less than one or two percent of the sulfur that appears associated with these infective centers that remains is present in the progeny phage. So the notion, this whole picture is consistent with the view that the DNA is the germinal material of the phage. And this is certainly harmonious with the observations of Avery some eight years earlier, Avery and his colleagues. Now, I think that it's all the retrospectoscope. The question is why it took the phage experiment to turn everybody on. Virtually everybody, almost everybody in the community, not everybody, but almost everybody in the community, bought it after they had this experiment, but didn't buy it after the Avery experiment. Although, my own view is that the Avery experiment is more compelling. But in a sense, the phage experiment is more visual. Now, I mean, you can think about this morphological entity injecting its DNA into a bacterium. Here, one is talking about a black box. You add DNA to solution, and some of the bacteria get changed. We'll talk more about this. <clears throat> In any case, now, let's ask the question, what are the properties that we want to ask in order to define, or demand, in order to define the genetic material. We want a material that is capable of storing information. A material that's capable of mobilizing the use of that information in an organism. It has to be possible to transmit that information or the material basis for that information to the progeny in a faithful way, in a reliable way. And the material ought to be reasonably stable, both physically and chemically. Otherwise, you lose information. You lose its integrity. And perhaps most important and most useful is the notion that it has to have, we have to devise a mechanism that endows it with a capacity for change because we know that mutations occur. Presumably, the, <coughs> the a mutation by definition is a genetic change that's transmitted to all the progeny. That has to be an alteration in the information content. And the question is, what is the structure of the material that we're talking about. Now, at the time that most of these experiments were done, or many of these experiments were done early on in any case, what was known about DNA? DNA was a polymer. It was a polymer that was made up of subunits that had phosphate, sugar, a pentose, five carbon sugar, and a base, a heterocyclic, one of four possible bases. This could be adenine, or guanine, or thymine, or cytosine. Those are the subunits. These subunits were strung together 
sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate in an asymmetric way because this sugar, the phosphate is coupled to the three position on the sugar at one end and the five position of the sugar at the other end. So this has a direction. That'll become important. Now, largely because of the transformation experiments, at least that's what Crick says, he became convinced that it was important to identify the structure of DNA. And the group at Cambridge and the group at London uh, not always uh, in a friendly fashion. The crystallography was done largely by Rosalind Franklin, and the interpretation, or the final interpretation, was done by Crick and Watson. And what they, what was clear from the X-ray scattering diagram of fibers of DNA was that the structure of the molecule had a repeated element in it had repeated elements in it along the length of the molecule. And it was a constellation of things that had to do with the kinds of repeats that were evident from the crystallography and the chemistry. The chemistry said that in any particular DNA, it looked as if the concentration of adenine and the concentration of thymine were equal, and the concentration of guanine and concentration of cytosine were equal. Now, if I remember correctly, it was Rosalind Franklin that proposed the notion that you could have two strands that interacted in opposite directions. And the idea is that you have base, sugar, phosphate, base, sugar, phosphate, and so on. The chemistry suggested that there was that there was something, adenines and thymines had something to do with each other, and guanines and cytosines had something to do with each other, and it was possible to construct an atomic model that allowed you to pair, by hydrogen bonding, adenines and thymines across, for example, across such a structure, so that this distance is the same when there's a CG base pair as it is when there's an AT base pair. In other words, the geometry was such that you could make a regular repeating structure if you paired only adenines with thymines and only cytosines with guanines in a manner that permitted base pairing. So that led to the suggest suggestion that DNA was made up of a repeating structure, in fact, a double helix, of two complementary strands. If one strand is going this way, then the other strand is going this way. Every place along that molecule, every, at every position, every sugar position, there is a base paired with a complementary base. <coughs> and that, in fact, this was the structure, this was proposed as the structure of DNA. Now, the Hydrogen bonding energies that hold, that could hold adenine and thymine together are modest. A pair of hydrogen bonds are probably of the order of uh, maybe a couple of kilocalories. But the fact of the matter is that if we think of a thousand of these strung together, the cooperative effect of modest energy interactions is very substantial. Now, and in fact, this molecule is very stable. Now, the question, how does a picture like this, a model like this, help us in terms of 
conceptualizing the function of DNA? Well, it was attractive in two ways, in several ways. If we have two complementary strands, then we can think of a way in which this structure could replicate could make a copy of itself or copies of itself. Consider a molecule with adenines and thymines and cytosines and guanines down the molecule. At every place you have the proper pair. Suppose one could conceive of a mode of replication in which these two strands separate and at every adenine here we lay down a thymine, and at every cytosine we lay down a guanine, and at every guanine we lay down a cytosine, so that we can lay down a new strand, which is in fact the same as this strand, C, G, C. So we can make copies of this if we have give this direction. We can lay down a copy simply by reading off the nucleotides on the basis of complementarity of the complementary composition and ultimately result in making two molecules that look like that. Okay, so we go on from one to two and these according to nucleotide composition and the identity of the nucleotide at every position on the molecule, these two are identical. These three are identical. Okay, so we have a way, at least conceptually, of thinking about how such a molecule could make more copies of itself. If we go the next cycle of replication, then we in principle should have a strand like this and another copy of this a pair of new strands okay so we now have four going through two divisions Okay, so we have a mode, a way of thinking about replication. Now, that's not enough. We have to have a way, in order for the model to be credible, we have to way, have a way of thinking about how could the information that resides in this presumed sequence be mobilized to make a protein, for example, to give you a phenotype. After all, we're talking about a build capacity to make the smooth polysaccharide or drug sensitivity versus drug, re drug resistance. These are all characteristic new properties of the organism. Presumably, they reflect some alteration in some protein. We'll, get, we'll discuss that in some detail later, but for the moment, that's sufficient. Now, how can we think about mobilizing the information? Well, since we've got a sequence of nucleotides, the sequence itself could be the place in which the re information resides. And if we could find some way, or we can devise certainly conceptually a way of translating that information into a peptide, we've got it made. Now, okay, the, we have, we, I mentioned stability, this structure is really quite stable. For normal, for example, E. coli DNA and 10th molar sodium chloride, you can take it up to 80 or 90 degrees before it falls apart. It does fall apart, but it's pretty stable. Now, the next question is, we want it to be able to change. Well, if we think about replication in this cartoon way, where an adenine that pre-existed in this strand picks up a thymine from the medium 
and then hooks, a guanine is hooked onto that because this, the parental strand says this is cytosine, I need a guanine, we can conceive of mistakes being made in that choice. So that, for example, at some site here, we could end up picking up a guanine instead of a, an adenine, opposite of thymine. And that would make a molecule that was somewhere here, Tg, this would be At at that particular location. This nucleotide is a mistake. And this constitutes a base pair mismatch. It's not one of the conventional base pairs. In the next generation, if nothing were to happen to this other than to allow replication, we would have the parent would again be TA, and here we would end up with a GC, and this would be a, a TA, and this would be a TA. So everybody would be Three of the products would be normal, and one of them would be altered. It would have a different nucleotide pair at that particular address. So we can conceive of a way in which, albeit presumably rarely, the sequence of nucleotides could experience an alteration. Okay. So the model satisfies many of the features that we would like to see in a structure that is capable uh, of, uh, that has the properties that we want. Now the question is, is the model right? Does the model have any credibility? You all of course know the answer to that, but let's look at one of the early experiments that tested the hypo this hypothesis for DNA strands being complementary and replicating by making copies of each other. Now, how can one go about testing such a hypothesis? If we had a way, if we had a way to tell the difference between new strands and old strands, we would be able to test the hypothesis. Now we can't do that with a radioisotope, because the radioisotope has, it reflects only a small fraction of the material it's labeled has the radioisotope, so everything looks hot. Now, Messelson and Stahl conceived of another way of labeling that would permit you to tell the difference between old strands and new strands. Another isotopic way. And the idea was, suppose you used heavy isotopes. For example, nitrogen, the nitrogen in our atmosphere, has a small fraction, most of it is nitrogen 14, has an atomic weight of 14. A small fraction of it has an atomic weight of 15. Carbon, for example, has a little bit less than 1% of the carbon is carbon-13. All the rest is carbon-11. Uh, carbon no, carbon-12. Okay, so we have carbon-12 and carbon-13 as naturally occurring isotopes. They're stable. We have nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 as naturally occurring isotopes. They're isotopes of oxygen naturally occurring. Now, we can fractionate nitrogen so that we can make reasonably pure nitrogen-15 containing, for example, ammonium chloride. You can buy it for at about 98% purity, isotopic purity. Now, suppose that we had DNA molecules that were made up of nitrogen-14 and we had DNA molecules that were made up of nitrogen-15. Those two DNA molecules would display different characteristic buoyant densities because one of them would have 
a heavier isotope of nitrogen in the, in the, in the nucleic acid bases. Okay? Now the difference in density is very small. DNA of E. coli, uh, ordinary DNA, at least in cesium chloride solution, is 1.708, and uh, with nitrogen 15, the DNA is 1.722. It's a real difference, but it's modest. Now, if we, if we had a way of separating species of these densities, then we could carry out an experiment in which E. coli that had been grown forever in nitrogen-14 medium, for example, or nit nitrogen-14 medium, were then transferred to a medium in which all the nitrogen were nitrogen-15. Then in this picture, we might expect that at time zero, all the DNA would be light, after one generation, about, we would expect all the DNA to be made up of light strands and heavy strands. This is the DNA molecule. And that after another ge generation, we would find DNA molecules that were fully heavy. And the half heavy molecules would persist. These should be uh, 14, 14. That's the prediction of this model. Now how can, how can one test such a model? <coughs> well, Massos and, and his colleagues, mostly I think Jerry Vinograd was the physical chemist involved, showed that you could measure such buoyant density differences or separate things on the basis of such buoyant density differences. In a, first we need a solution, an aqueous solution that is sufficiently heavy so that something will float in this medium. Okay, and the solution that was used was cesium chloride, which is very soluble and makes very dense aqueous solutions. So one can make a cesium chloride solution of, say, 1.715. That doesn't help you. You mix your DNA up in that solution and it's dispersed, okay? How can you use, how, how can you fractionate on the basis of buoyancy, it's easy to see how you could do it with a bubble that you can see, but how do you do it with a molecule of DNA? Well, with a solution of this sort, if it's placed in a very high gravitational field, that solution will, will distribute itself, the, the cesium chloride would distribute itself, according to what you'd expect for the distribution of material in a high gravitational field. And so, you can get a high gravitational field in a centrifuge, so that if you have a pair of centrifuge tubes with cesium chloride solutions in them, and you're spinning this very hard, at time zero, if you look at the bottom versus the top, and the, the density, everybody is the same, okay? You made a homogeneous solution of cesium chloride. With time, in this centrifugal field, the cesium chloride moves, it doesn't centrifuge to the bottom because it's sitting in a field that just distributes itself, redistributes itself on the basis of diffusion and the field. And what you see is a gradient of concentration of cesium chloride. Now, at 40,000 RPM in an ultra centrifuge, it takes about a day or two day and a half for such a gradient to establish itself, starting with a uniform solution. Now, if you have in this solution a DNA preparation, the DNA 
does have a substantial sedimentation coefficient and will move down the gradient until it can't move anymore because it's buoyed up. Its density is lower than that of the material below it. So that with a DNA of a density of 1.708, what would happen is that the DNA would accumulate at a position which is 1.708. And since the molecule is so, so large, the band will be very tight. You're establishing an equilibrium between diffusion and the centrifugal field. Diffusion determines the breadth of the band. DNA that is labeled with nitrogen 15 with a buoyant density of 1.722 would appear at another position in the gradient. This is 1.722. If after the uh, there are any one of a number of things that one can do. In an analytical gradient, you can scan the tube with regard to the location of the various DNA components on the basis of using, making use of the absorption. The DNA absorbs in the UV rather uh, vigorously. Or one can allow the centrifuge to come to rest. One can take the tube out. You can puncture the, puncture the bottom of the tube and collect drops in a series of collection tubes. And so the first drops that will come out will represent the bottom. And as you go along with drop collecting, you'd find one fraction of DNA, and then nothing, and then another fraction of DNA. Well, Messelson and Stahl carried out this experiment. They grew the bacteria in nitrogen of one isotopic co composition, displaying a characteristic buoyant density. They allowed the bacteria to go through one generation, and they showed that the, D the density of the DNA isolated from the bacteria that have been grown one generation is halfway between that of fully labeled light and fully labeled heavy, all of it. After a second generation, they find <coughs> equal amounts of DNA that is half heavy and fully heavy, just as one would anticipate in this fictitious model that I've put up for you. Not quite contrived, but OK? So now, how do you know, how could you know that these molecules have, as all this is consistent with the, with the picture that we're drawing and the model that was proposed by Watson and Crick. But how do we know that this is one strand, one of these strands is light and the other strand is heavy? It's got the right buoyant density, but how would you test it? Well, the hypothesis is that the strands are held together by hydrogen bonds, predominantly by hydrogen bonds. And that if one then were to raise the temperature to 100 degrees or 90 degrees so that hydrogen bonding energies disappear or hydrogen bonding energies with water become predominant, then these strands should come apart. And this DNA should resolve itself into two density species that differ by this much. The actual characteristic density of single-stranded DNA is not the same as that of double-stranded. That's why I'm confining myself. We know how, what that difference is, but uh, the fact of the matter is that when you take this material isolated from bacteria that have gone through one generation and denature it, it resolves itself into two species. One of them, the characteristic density of denatured light DNA and the other characteristic density of denatured heavy DNA. So we have the outcome of this is that we have a very strong supporting set of experiments that convince us that this picture that was originally contrived, the model for DNA, looks as if it's right. 
Now, this, the question of whether this is, this is uh, the B form, there are various forms of double helix that you can conceive of that in fact occur. But the replication is in fact what they call semi-conservative. One strand remains immortal, and that strand lays down a copy each time. And its copy then becomes immortal. Here we have the immortality. This strand is present here, and present here, and we present in the next generation. Okay, we have some, uh, we have handouts for, this, this is the answer to the first problem set. Please take only one copy.